Good afternoon. In my previous talk, I introduced the bottom-up story concept, and I showed that it has a tangible practical application, my philanthropic proposals. This is just one question. Why an, a very abstract concept like bottom-up story has practical applications? I'm going to try to answer in this talk. And this is just not an intellectual curiosity. If we could answer that, then we could investigate if we could apply uh, that, something like that with similar concepts. I'm also going to show um, two more applications of the bottom of story concept. But let me start with a background story. My wife and I moved to London in 1994, and our sons looked like this in 2000. At the time, I started using Amazon. A few years before, I had enjoyed Technopoly by Neil Postman. Amazon allowed me some, something that was new back then, which was to check the list of books by Neil Postman. So when I saw this one, I immediately bought it because I was very interested in, in, in education with such a young kids. This book changed my life. I learned that the concept of narrative. And as soon as I finished it, I started writing a letter of gratitude to Neil Postman. But that letter became too long. So I decided to turn it into a letter to our sons. I decided that this letter would be like a form of life insurance. I wanted to leave the best download of my mind that I could make. Uh, so the letter became this book. Questions, books, and videos. I finished it in 2004. It was never published. I mean, my father organized his private printing in Barcelona. I have the book available in Spanish uh, in, on my, in my website. Uh, uh, sorry, I haven't had the time to translate it to English. And uh, each chapter has a name, a name, a question that has been with me for a long time. Here are some of the questions. All of them are open-ended. I do not claim to have a definitive answer to any of them. Most of the time, they lead to more questions. For each of them, I wrote an essay, and I created a list of the best books and videos that I knew about the topic. A friend told me back then that some Jewish communities have a similar tradition called ethical will, where, uh, which is a document that, uh, to, that they write to pass ethical values from one generation to the next. I also decided to leave my sons as a life insurance, the best library that I could buy. I should clarify that I didn't want to force our sons to read anything in particular. My idea was to do like Montessori, to create a stimulating environment and then give freedom within it. It was in the process of writing this book that I had the idea of donating a copy of my personal library. Writing my book, I faced a problem. Many times I was quoting uh, other books because I, I thought I can explain things better than the expert. But at some point, I had to call the quotes. This lead me, led me to notice an imbalance between the reader and the writer. The reader does not necessarily have access to the books that the writer quotes and references. So I decided to send all the books that I reference in my book. So one way of seeing the collection is that my book is like a, a, a homepage of the collection. What I did was to send what in graph theory uh, called the neighborhood of a note. So as you can see, I have been thinking for a long time with, uh, on the, in the analogy of books and references on, on, on the one side and website and hyperlinks on the other. But uh, websites reference books, books reference websites. By the way, many websites that are referenced uh, 20 years ago no longer exist. So a question I have, uh, well, sorry, the whole thing is even more complex because there are all these other things that reference, uh, they, each of them can reference all the others. So I don't know if there is a name for all this, this set of things that we build every day, but let me call it a big information network. And the question that I have with me is how to organize this big information network. If we call the old network uh, books and libraries, well, they have their, their system of cataloging and the new network internet, the paradigm that most people have been thinking since the popularization of internet is to use internet to replace the old network. But I, I think I have, I have shown that we could use the new network to improve the old one. After all, internet is the biggest catalog of books ever and by far the largest supermarket of books ever. So now let me turn to the question, uh, that uh, the first question I posed at the beginning of this talk. But to discuss that, I want to discuss uh, for a moment what makes mathematics useful. I used to tell my students that it was abstractions because mathematical models are abstract and you can apply them to the different sciences. Or you could have a mathematical model developed in physics, for example, heat diffusion, that can later be applied to model how the probabilities of a share price diffuse. But I think abstractions, to say abstraction is not enough. 
because after all, the singer Prince changed legally his name to this abstract symbol. And maybe that was useful to him, but it's not useful for, for everyone. So there are several factors that make mathematics useful. One would be logical reasoning, but let me focus on the following one. It's the fact that we can take data from the real world, put it in the mathematical world, then perform some abstract operations, and they take the results back to the real world. As an example, if I want to measure the area of this room, I could measure the length, six meters, the width, five meters, and then six times five, the area is 30 square meters. Well, that six times five was an abstract operation. I mean, the example is so simple, uh, so trivial, something that we learned in primary school that, that we don't even think that six times five was an, an abstract operation. And mathematics, I mean, all these different layers and layers have, uh, of mathematics have abstract operations. Many times there are generalizations of number operations. For example, matrix, matrix multiplication is a generalization of number multiplication. Now, there is another field that uses abstract operations. If you mention the word Q, most people think about this. Well, maybe not in Barcelona, Spain. There, they have a special way of queuing. When you arrive to a small shop, people are all over the place. But you have to shout, who is the last one? And then someone raises the hand, and now you are the last one. So, but if you mention Q to a computer scientist, the computer scientists will think in a first in, first out data type where there are two abstract operations in Q, adding a new element to the back, and DQ, removing an element from the front. If you mention the word stack, most people will think of something like this. But a computer scientist will think about this. A last in, first out data type where there are two abstract operations, push, putting something in the top of the stack, and pop, taking something from the top of the stack. Sounds a bit silly, push and pop, but the stacks are very useful. For example, to translate recursively from a high level programming language to a low level one. So I have shown you a couple of examples of what computer scientists call abstract data type. I mean, the idea of an abstract data type is you, def you define the behavior of the operations in an abstract way not, without worrying about the, their implementation. So. So they, computer scientists, we can build abstract algorithms and, and, uh, and independent of the implementation of which programming language they will be programmed later. In a sense, the word book has become a, an abstract data type because a book could, could have different implementation, I mean, different formats. It could be physical, digital, or an audio book. So now let me introduce the abstract data type um, inspired by the big history concept. The concept that is part of the extra data type is the bottom of story, and the abstract data type is called bottom of story. So the potential values of this abstract data type are all the things in that big information network that I mentioned before. And the operations are two. Instead of push and pop, the operations are package and reproduce. For example, I mentally package my books at home as a history of ideas collection and then I reproduce it in my university in Venezuela. The implementation of these operations could be digital, physical, both a combination. So the abstract data type is agnostic about it. So my answer to the question, what makes practical such a uh, abstract concept is these abstract operations. Okay, so I leave open the idea. Could we apply the idea of abstract operations to other big history concepts? I don't know. I, I just put it on the table. Okay, now the applications. Can we visit someone's mind? This is similar to my idea of downloading my mind as a life insurance. So people of my generation has had more frequently the, the, the experience than, than John Werner negations of the experience of visiting a, a personal library and uh, being able to, to check with curiosity I mean, browse the books, records, videos that are there. And it's a bit, I felt for a long time, oh, it's a bit like visiting the mind of the person. With increasing digitalization, uh, this social interaction is decreasing and decreasing. I think we're losing it a bit. Uh, now, currently, I mean, I don't they, dare to ask people for their phone or tablet to, to check what they are reading. Maybe the only thing that has become easy is to share a Spotify playlist. 
Now, regarding this question, I have a, an anecdote. A few months ago, I met for the very first time uh, an Imperial College professor. And in that very first meeting, he gave me this book as a gift, telling me, I, I'm sure that you are going to love this book. How could that be? What happened is that 15 years ago, he was a user of the History of Ideas collection in Venezuela. So he knew my mind in a way because he visited a copy of my personal library. But nowadays, my answer to this question is that not necessarily, because the books have not been selected and organized with, with the purpose of answering, the, the, I mean, trying to reflect the mind of the, the person. But I think that we can come up with a questionnaire to build a, a collection called The Mind of Someone. The first question that comes to our mind is obviously, what, which are your favorite books or videos, etc., which means normally what you enjoy the most. But Bill Gates is not saying here that he enjoy a lot Backlash Mill books. What he's saying here is that if you want to go and note the name of the, of the documentary, if you want to go to the part of his brain or his mind where he has knowledge about energy, the best thing you can do is to go to Backlash Mill books. So I think that a better question to ask is which books, papers, etc., have most influence what you think and how you behave. And I propose that the answer would be uh, to limit it, I mean, in the tens of items, I mean, 10, 20. And also as an essay or, and or a video explaining why the selection. I mean, you could have an even more detailed questionnaire the following way. You could first ask which question in, in, questions intrigue you the most. And then for each of those questions, ask the question before, I mean, for example, if the question, uh, one question that intrigues someone is, how could I be more ecological? Then the answer will be, oh, according to these, things, these sources I have read, I have changed the way I think or how I behave, trying to be more, more ecological. And then I would limit, again, in the tens uh, per question. Okay. Now, we could also ask a question that is outside the big information network. I mean, is what games do you recommend? For big history, I recommend the general interest uh, version of Timeline where they go back to, to things uh, uh, that are covered uh, in big history. And, and in the game, you don't need to know when these things happen. I mean, you just need to be able to guess how to sort them, okay? So now we, when, once we have the answer to, to the questionnaire, we can package and reproduce. So which months we would like to visit? The possibilities are numerous. And uh, people, you could think successful people in different fields. You could say, how come I mentioned dead people? We cannot ask a questionnaire to dead people. Well, I know at least of one case that did something like this. Jorge Luis Borges wanted to create a uh, hundred works of literature and write introductions for each of them. He managed to do 74 be before dying. So that's a precedent of what I I'm proposing to do. Okay, the other application is, what is humanity's disaster recovery plan? And what I'm thinking is a, a global catastrophe that maybe wipes out the, the power network or, or wipes it out for, for some years. So Lewis Darnell has written a, a book regarding this. But I don't know if you have read the novel or seen the series uh, called Station Eleven. There in a post-apocalyptic world, 20 years after a, a global catastrophe where almost no one has electricity, there is a nomadic group of actors and musicians that perform Shakespeare, Shakespeare plays and uh, classical music. Uh, they go around the small towns that have survived. And their motto is survival is insufficient. Meaning, yes, of course we need to survive, but also, we also need to preserve culture. So that leads me to this open question that I leave. Which books, papers, et cetera, you think that every public, I mean, you, ideally you would like to have in every public library in the world, Physically, because now we are talking about a, a, a risk where we lose power network. Uh, so in, in case, I mean, like a backup, okay? So that, like a disaster recovery plan. So I just want to finish with a quote by Carl Sagan, which says, uh, our concern for the future can be tested by how well we support our libraries. Thank you very much. <laughs>